Good morning, or hello, and welcome. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kitshanu B'mitzvotav V'tzivanu Ba'asok B'divrei Torah. Amen. Thank you, Harlan. So we're going to go into the screen share at this point. And I trust that you can see what's going on here. All right, so we are now into a whole new book, right? Um, this is the way in which uh, the Torah readings are working out. We're in the re the book of Shemot, the names, and that's because the way books are titled within Jewish uh, tradition has to do with the first significant word in the first sentence of the book. Uh, be yeah? Rabbi, before we go on, mm. uh, Joseph and Jacob were embalmed. I imagine because Jacob had to go a long distance uh, to the cave of the uh, pair of uh, patriarchs, so they embalmed Jacob, so he wouldn't smell, you know, the, the odor and everything. The same with uh, Joseph. Joseph was going to be in Egypt for a long time before his bones were carried back to the cave again. I imagine, but we don't embalm our, our people, do we? It's against uh, our religion. Right. We we allow the body to, to retain its natural situation in terms of returning back to the dust. Yeah. Hey, Harlan, I wonder yeah. if you remember there was a time in St. Louis where about in the, I want to say in the 70s or something, when people were being embalmed because my grandmother was. Right. Yeah, I remember yeah. that. Yeah, and I couldn't understand it. Yeah, and, and and they were they they used to be uh, watchers at the at the one of the at one of the homes at the funeral homes. Yeah, I, know so I didn't understand that at all. Yes, I I was thinking of that too because I wasn't so I got to this to St. Louis in the eighties, and that was happening. Anyway, we're getting off subject a lot yeah, on yeah. this one. Go ahead. Okay, so I don't want to go too far. All I can say is that at this stage of my life, I would say, you know, I would want to have to look it up. I'd have to research it. And, and it's possible that what happened there to Joseph and Jacob, we could put down to a simple answer, which is at that point, the Torah had not been given. That's one, one point. And that the customs of the country, which did not affect uh, idolatry or anything like that, uh, were being practiced. It could be. There's a lot more that could be said about it, uh, but I don't want to do that now. I'm not prepared for it, and I, I also, uh, as as I do this, I become more and more aware of my own ignorance and my own lack of knowledge on these subjects, and the requ the requirement of doing further research, and also that there are different traditions and things that I used to see think were fixed in stone actually aren't fixed in stone, and that there's a lot more pliability. Uh, within within the tradition, but you try to do what's right, and and essentially what you try to do is to, I would say, I know this is very crassly put, but make God happy, to 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 make to give God reason for having created you, and and that's the that's sort of the filter that you go through. Is what I'm about to do, is it right in God's eyes? And the Torah, of course, gives us the light to see those eyes and, and to try and have some measure. But um, the circumstances, as you've heard me say so many times, circumstances alter cases, and that's the way in which the Torah comes down from heaven down to earth. So back into this, let's go to where we are. Just to summarize a little bit, um, we, have, we have read about the enslavement of the Israelites, uh, by the way, lack of appreciation. There's a wonderful interpretation about a new pharaoh, quote right, a new pharaoh rising over Egypt. And the and the interpretation of that is it wasn't a new pharaoh. It was a pharaoh that decided that they were going to have a whole new set uh, of, of how they were going to deal with the Israelites because they were afraid of them. And so it, and that he didn't remember, it says he doesn't remember what Joseph had done. Lack of appreciation, folks. OK, well, it wasn't that he didn't know what Joseph had done. Right. If, if the story goes the way the story goes, well, how do you forget that? No, he didn't want to. He didn't want to remember it. So true about appreciation. You just overlook it. Don't 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 give it much uh, of, of valency at all. So those are parts of 
the early part. Anyway, the Israelites are enslaved. We read about the the edict of era of Pharaoh to cast the boy babies into the Nile. We read, I think I trust that you're familiar with all of that. And at this point, Moses has grown up. He's a young man. He goes out. He grows up in Pharaoh's court. He goes out and he sees um, a, a taskmaster beating an Israelite to death. And he kills the taskmaster. And then he goes and sees two Israelites fighting with each other. And he tries to stop them. And one of them says, oh, you're going to do to me what you did to the Egyptian. And at this point, we have this verse here where Moses says, Achen nor da hadavar. Indeed, this matter of my killing that Egyptian is known. They know about it. Okay. Vayishma paro et hadavar hazeh. And Pharaoh heard of this thing, this matter. Vayvakesh laharog et Moshe. And he sought to kill Moses, to have Moses executed. Vayivrach Moshe mipnei paro. And Moses fled from Pharaoh's presence. So notice the word panim, we've had this expression many, many times, means the face, but it means the presence right here. The presence, or it can mean surface, things like that. From Pharaoh's presence, vayeshev be'eretz midyan, and he dwelt in the land of Midian. Vayeshev, notice how the vayeshev is repeated in this text. Those things... Um, matter because this is a text, right? Vayeshev al Haba'er, and he sat, in this case, this particular word, it's the same root, but in the, here the context tells you he sat at the um, the well, the well. So Rashi's going to have a few things to tell us about this. Vayishma paro, Pharaoh heard. Well, he heard something, right? Haim Hilshinu Alav. They informed on him, right? They informed on Moses. And we have in our Amidah, it says, La Malshinim Lo Tahe Tikva, let the informers not have hope, not let them not be able to succeed in what they're trying to accomplish. Now, who is the they here? It doesn't say specifically, but we could be talking about generally the two Israelites who are fighting are identified as I think Datan and Aviram who show up in the book of Numbers. And that's a again a methodology of interpretation where when someone is identified as a wicked person, you look for the identified wicked people and then you apply the generality as it is here to those wicked people. So it's a way of minimizing the number of wicked people that we are told about. So at any rate, the idea that uh, one of them or both of them informed on Moses, because they obviously knew about it, right? We read that directly in the text. And he sought to kill Moses. So exactly what do we mean? How did he do it? Masro. So what happened was, uh, we're saying the the drash is that he actually almost succeeded. Masaro la costinar, he handed him over. That is Pharaoh handed Moses over to the executioner, la hargo to execute him to kill him. Velo shalta et hacherev, but the sword did not have an ability to kill Moses. It bounced off his neck. And how do we know that? This is referenced directly by Moses himself when he says, He rescued me, that is God, rescued me from the sword of Pharaoh. And again, I think that when we look at this as literature, we understand these kinds of statements. They don't seem to be so crazy. Uh, if we don't look at it historically, that how, however, that, you know, the point is that he was able to escape this. And also it's, it's the fact that Pharaoh had such power. You know, you look at individuals, even today, 
who are empowered so much that they have the ability to, you know, decide life and death over individuals on a personal level without any, without any appeal to justice. Uh, although here, perhaps, it might have involved justice. But regardless, Moses was able to escape. And again, these kinds of statements, these kinds of midrashim, uh, actually are there to give us an opportunity to meditate on what's what's the message going on here. Going on by Yeshev Be'eretz Midyan. Now, you can see the parenthesis here. And the, the question is that this could be that it's not in all manuscripts of Rashi, that there's certain manuscripts or, or printed editions that have this. So there may be, in fact, a question as to whether this is Rashi, original Rashi, or whether or not it's a later uh, editorial uh, adaptation or, or insertion or something like that. But these, there's a reason for these parentheses. Vayeshev be'eretz Mitzray, uh, be'eretz Midian, and he dwelt in the land of Midian. So when it says dwell, what's the sort of the connotation of that? Does it mean, in fact, to become a permanent resident, or does it mean just temporarily? So Rashi clarifies that. And he says, Nit Akev Sham, which means he tarried there. And my understanding of the word tarry is that one is just staying there um, until one can leave. That that's the idea of tarrying somewhere. So the point is that he wasn't planning on settling because Vayeshev can also mean to settle. But Rashi's clarifying that Moses had no intention of settling in Midian. Now, what's interesting here is that when he says it's like, right, uh, and it says Vayeshev Yaakov, there's no reference here, right, to this particular quotation. Now, the famous Vayeshev Yaakov is the one that starts off the Parsha Vayeshev Yaakov, the Eretz Megure Aviv, right, that Jacob dwelt in the land of his father's sojournings right his father's tarryings no more sojournings so the difference is sojourning again means you're not a permanent resident but in that case it doesn't have that connotation of tarrying which is i'm just staying there until i can leave so at any rate the the lovely marvelous midrash on this vayesh of yaakov in that context is that he wanted to. He had finally, remember, he'd spent 20 years with Lavan, 20 rather miserable years, and here he was finally coming back. He'd settled the issues with Esau. He didn't have to worry about Esau wanting to kill him anymore, and he thought he was going to be able to be a, to return to the land of his fathers and, and dwell with some sense of security. And the very next sentence talks about Joseph. So it could also, but that's not tarrying. Jacob didn't want to tarry. So is there another, the question that's going through my mind is, is there some other Vayeshev Yaakov that is being referenced here? But I don't think so. So I'm trying to puzzle this out. For me, it's a puzzle because Rashi appears to be comparing the one Vayeshev Be'eretz Midian for Moses to the one with Jacob. And um, the reason the explanation in the Midrash regarding Jacob is just how much he wanted to, how much he hoped to. So does he, when he says, when Rashi says he tarried there, when he says like Jacob, Vayeshev, means it isn't like that, right? That, um, that he's saying he tarried there, not like Jacob tarry, uh, or Jacob settled, okay? So it, it could, could be read that way, but that would be an unusual way of reading it, right? So enough on that for now. So now we have this repetition, right? This exact same word, Vayeshev al Haba'er. So Lamad Miyakov, and again, look at this. We've got this comparison to Jacob, 
right? He learned from Jacob, and this is very sweet, because he found his life's companion, right? His wife, al Habair, by being by the well. And uh, it's interesting, right? Exactly the connotations of wells, right? And the idea of wells allowing life to take place. And the idea also of being able to um, procreate regarding life. And so possibly there's that connection. You also are very familiar with the story of Rebecca also at the well. And uh, at any rate, there's some significance uh, uh, as to uh, Moses, of course, finds um, he finds Zipporah here. And Jacob, of course, fell in love with Rachel the moment he set eyes on her back on Jacob when he saw Rachel for the first time. He just fell in love with her. And of course, the Torah is very clear about the pain that goes along with love as well, of falling in love, falling in love. Onwards. So there's some parallels here. They clearly are. Rashi's pointing them out, and we're going to see it. You're going to see it yourself. Midian Sheva Banot, the Kohen of Midian. And Rashi has told us, or or I believe it was Rashi, even though it's it's his priest, right? Kohen, we think, right? Kohen essentially means minister. And just like we have a minister regarding uh, a political position or a leadership, so it could also mean the chieftain, at least understanding it that way, that he wasn't. But on the other hand, there are also traditions that understand this word Kohen as literally meaning priest. So I'm just, all I'm doing is just opening up the possibility that Kohen is somewhat ambivalent. It's not, uh, sorry, ambiguous, ambiguous. So that he had seven daughters. Vatavona, Vatidlena, and just like Rachel back in the days of Jacob, right? He had these daughters. He didn't have sons is what this is saying to us. And they came and they drew water and they filled et harahatim, the water troughs, son avihem, in order to water the, sh the sheep of their father. So we have these seven daughters coming. And of course, this was not, forgive me for the expression, this was not the work for women. So there's some significance there. But in this particular case, in the case of Lavan, he just didn't care, uh, and he he had his daughters do whatever he wanted them to do, as far as that was concerned. Here, I think the implication, because we read that Lavan also had sons, we know he had sons, but here we realize that the that uh, Jethro, who's unnamed here at this point, right, um, is doesn't have sons to help take care of these things, so all seven of them came out to help in this case. So let's take a look at Rashi. Okay, so here we go. Ula Kohen Midian, and to the Kohen of Midian. And here he says, Rav Shebahen, right? He was the most important amongst them, or meaning, meaning that he was the leader. He was their leader. Upiresh lo me'avodat kochavim. Ah, so we have a little bit more uh, interpretation, how Rashi appears to combine the idea of Kohen meaning leader and still of Kohen meaning priest. And what it means is he went away from the idol from idolatry. Avodat Kochavim is uh, idolatry. Uh, oh, so interesting. Veniduhu me'etzlam. This means that the other Midianites Right, the people of Midian uh, actually excommunicated him. They didn't want to have anything to do with him because he no longer was worshiping idols. So here, possibly the backstory is that he was a priest, that he decided that idolatry was improper, 
not the way for a person to behave, and that in some ways he was already on the path of becoming uh, a Hebrew, or a, well, I can use it in an anachronistic sense, a Jew. Because we know later on, at the in Parsha Yitro, that there he, in fact, we say that he, in fact, had a bris. Okay. So that's interesting. So we, we have the fact that he's referred to as Kohen, but now he's also their leader, but it's not of all of them. It's just a small group of Midianites, who perhaps his family, who followed him. Et harahatim. So this rahat has, I believe it's actually an Aramaism as well, and it has to do with uh, quick flowing, something like that. So that uh, I believe that it has that. It brechot meru. Okay, there we go. Merutzot hamayim. Right. So he says the troughs, the brecha, the or the um, gosh, the the watering trough. Meru. Pool. Go ahead, please, Lauren. The brecha is a pool. Pool. Thank you. I'm going to write that in so that I can remember that. Thank you. Merutzot uh, hamayim. So merutzot from rats to means to run, right? And rahat has that same meaning. So in other words, they were flowing pools, asuyot pa'aretz, which were made in the ground. That were made in the ground. On a little bit more. Vayavu, and now we have again a uh, a little bit different from Rachel, but again, there's this uh, conflict of some sort. Here it's a more serious conflict uh, of the other shepherds, of the men shepherds and these women. And the shepherds came, they arrived, and they chased them away. They chased away the seven daughters of Jethro. So now we have another example of an injustice taking place. And we don't have a lot of stories about Moses's early life, right? He is actually 80 years old when God sends him off to um, take the Israelites out of Egypt, to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. But we're seeing this sense of injustice and Moses is willing to get involved. Vayakum Moshe, Moses arose, Vayoshi An, and he uh, rescued them from, again, uh, Lahoshia, Rav Lahoshia, great to save someone. And the word Yehoshua, Joshua, is a, associated with this word. Okay. Vayashk et sonam, and he watered their sheep. So, we have these few stories about Moses, but they all seem to have a common, a, a common theme about Moses being willing to get involved when he saw an injustice taking place. And uh, that's, that's really a significant thing. It's not easy always to get involved. Okay, somebody's um, off of mute. Yes, go ahead, please. Judith? Yeah. 80 years old. Yes, I know. So he wasn't know. married. No. You know, what does this 80 years mean? It's not our 80 years. I would argue that it is. Remember, we're talking about literature here. Uh, and uh, I believe that he is. Um, that he had to mature. That he was uh, a really mature person. And he'd learned a lot of lessons. We read at the end of Deuteronomy how uh, Moses' strength, even at 120, his strength hadn't abated, right? Uh, mm -hmm. That he had not withered in any way. So again, there's a point being made here. Uh, and of course, some people, I know we can try and push it towards experience that some people don't age the way other people age. And the fact is, do we really understand fully aging and the aging process? I'm not sure that we do. It's just maybe my lack of ignorance. Judith, go follow up by all means. Go ahead. 
no, that's just, I'm not understanding him in his, um, for him to be that old and not connected and being a prince raised in, yes. in, yes. in Egypt is strange. So I, I could say that he might not have been 80 at this point. He may have stayed for a while. So we don't know how many years he was with Jethro. On the other hand, he had two sons on his way back. Uh, to, when he, you know, when he's on his way back to Egypt, uh, he already has two sons. I'm not sure how long he stayed. He stayed there. Possibly, we'll find out. I don't know. I don't have any recollection that we read about how many years he was there. But he he could have been there for a number of years, and certainly you know, to a point where he was informed that that they no longer were searching him, searching for him to kill him. So we don't know. He might have quite well have been younger. Could have been 20 years. We might have a parallelism, uh, a parallel with Jacob, you know, and that an implied parallel from the parallels that are being brought out right now. And we might be able to extrapolate. At any rate, uh, He's mature enough to do this. I was just pointing out that at the moment when God actually sends him in the process, uh, by the time they come out of Egypt, he's 80 years old because of the 40 years wandering, and he um, and he died at 120. So it's just a process of arithmetic. So let's take a look here. Okay. Uh, Vayigarshum, he chased them away. Mipnei Hanidui. That's an interesting statement. So, uh, is it saying here, the Nidui, remember, is excommunication. And maybe it's saying he had, the issue is, why, why does the Torah actually say that he chased them away, chased away the shepherds? And it, Rashi is saying, on account of the excommunication. So excommunication means, so we're given a little bit of a, a an explanation as to why those shepherds chased away the daughters of, Mid, of Jethro and why Moses had to chase away the, uh, away, sorry, let me make sure, sorry, I'm not, this isn't about Moses. Forgive me, I was not... Uh, I, I, here we go. Hold on a second. Uh, here we're talking about the shepherds who chased them away. So, mo sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, I was thought I was thinking of the chasing away to Moses, obviously, and I was wrong. Okay, so we're talking about the shepherds chasing away the daughters of Midian, and Rashi's saying he chased them away because of this excommunication, this ban, this excommunication. That's why I got rid of, why the shepherds chased them away. And I think that could be the Rashi on this. Yes. So this is a good place to stop. And I apologize. I, <laughs> oh gosh, that's, that's why one has to go over this again and again. So, all right, let's mark it here. And we'll, God willing, tomorrow we'll continue the story. Right here. Okay. Stop the share, and um, I'll stop the I'll stop the recording.